we can take minutes. Your line is now muted. So that we can take minutes um, accurately, we're actually being recorded. So just so you know, um, that's what that was about. Uh, I do want to thank, uh, we have some uh, special presenters today, and one of those presenters uh, is Nicole Rinaldi from Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, she's a biologist and she specializes in the bog turtle uh, recovery, uh, of which she's uh, definitely helps NRCS when we go to place easements in these areas. So um, welcome, Nicole, and hope you can um, join us and I'll turn it over to you. Nicole, are you there or, or are you on mute? Do we see her? Yeah, she's here. Yeah, it looks like she's muted. Okay, so Tim, Nicole has to be taken off mute. So that this, is Allison. this is Allison Whitlock. Um, I'm going to be starting the presentation. Okay, thanks, Allison. Sure. I'm just opening up the presentation. Now, thank you. And hopefully, you can see and hear me. Yeah, we see you, Allison. Thank you. And we All can right, hear you great. just fine. Thank you. All right, wonderful. Um, I'm going to just get a little pointer here ready as well. All right, so. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Allison Whitlock, and I work with Nicole in uh, the Pennsylvania field office. Um, I'm new, relatively new to the field office, but I am not new to bog turtles. I've been working with bog turtles for mm, 30 years now uh, in various capacities throughout the re region and the range of the bog turtle. So I'm very happy to be here in Pennsylvania, which truly is the heart of uh, bog turtles. So, uh, why am I not clicking? Oh, because I have the annotation on, I guess. Let me turn my pointer off. Um, okay, there we go. All right, so the first part I'm going to be presenting, and the second part Nicole will be presenting. So I'm going to go over the species status and natural history of the bog turtle, including uh, habitat, seasonal activities and threats, and then um, I'll hand it over to Nicole. So the bog turtle uh, is uh, Glyptonese Muhlenbergii, so uh, we're still stuck right now in the federal system calling it the old name of Clemmies. That will be uh, officially um, changed soon. But it's the smallest turtle in North America. It's the fourth smallest turtle in the world. It is in part because of its size, it is a highly prized and illegal global pet trade. It's listed on the IUCN CITES Red List, and it's also considered one of the most imperiled turtles on the planet. And it is only found in the wild in the eastern United States, from Massachusetts to Georgia. It's divided into two populations, and the northern population that goes from Massachusetts to Maryland was listed as federally threatened under the Endangered Species Act in 1997. It is a habitat specialist. It is only found associated with springside wetlands. Some of these are small and isolated, or they can be part of large wetland complexes. They have been documented to travel up to four miles, including overland from suitable habitat, although typically they don't travel very much and they stay within um, with a smaller wetland area. It's also been documented that they can live up to 60 years of age. There are two turtles that have been documented to be at least 60 years. This is one of them, and both of them are Pennsylvania turtles. In 2001, the recovery plan was um, issued, and the map for the range at that time um, is shown here in black, the historic or extirpated areas, and in the lighter mottled color, you can see where it was considered extant at that time. You can also see here on the map where the southern population is down from Virginia to Georgia. Uh, you can see that there's a, uh, this huge gap between the northern and the southern populations. So how do we assess what bog turtles are doing in terms of, of their status? Uh, it was a, um, 
Data was collected and analyzed uh, in 1997 when the listing was issued and then presented uh, in the recovery plan. The recovery plan identified five recovery units, which are geographic areas that can uh, target the progress of conservation and recovery in meeting the specific recovery criteria. Um, and I will get to the recovery criteria in just a minute. Uh, the next uh, stage over the years, um, states uh, were working independently um, with some communication across the range. And in 2011, when an effort was made to um, gather the data and do a status assessment, it was clear that, that uh, there was a lot of variation in how the data was collected and reported. And it was determined by the group that um, there needed to be consistent monitoring protocols, uh, data collection, and reporting. At this regional meeting, there were biologists from many different agencies and, uh, and as well as state agencies. There were people from uh, academia. There were consultants there. Um, it, was a, it was a large group of people that were involved in some way, shape, or form with bog turtles and they shared their information, things that they had been learning, and they took place in uh, identifying and prioritizing data needs, threats, and conservation actions. Following that meeting, there was uh, more coordination uh, taking place between all these various partners. And in 2015, a competitive state wildlife grant was awarded um, to the state uh, where the, they hired MACAC as a con contractor. And uh, over the next couple of years, a conservation plan was developed. And again, this was across state lines with multiple partners. I've given the uh, website here for you to get the conservation plan. Um, we're also going to be putting it on our website, and I believe the uh, Fish and Boat Commission has it. I strongly encourage anyone who's interested in bog turtle conservation going forward to, to take a look at this plan because it identifies all the most recent data that's been collected across the way in terms of prioritizing different kinds of conservation actions going forward. Um, there are also uh, appendices that break down the information by recovery units. And Pennsylvania is part of two different recovery units, specifically, um, and you can find those in Appendix A and E. So the recovery criteria that we are trying to measure our success by um, are fourfold. One is uh, long-range protection for at least 185 populations distributed among the five recovery units and that there is monitoring at five-year intervals over a 25-year period that, that shows that 185 populations are stable or increasing, that illicit collection and trade is no longer constituting a threat, and that long-term habitat dynamics are sufficiently understood to be able to monitor and manage threats to habitats and turtles, including succession, invasive wetland plants, hydrology, and predation. So keeping those criteria in mind, that it needs to be uh, looked at across the, the northern range and the, uh, within the recovery units, you can see starting uh, at the northern part, the PPLP, there is um, still some extant populations in New York within this recovery unit it's called the Prairie Peninsula Lake Plain Recovery Unit. Pennsylvania used to have populations. It's out in the Pima Tuning area, and no turtles have been found out there in decades. Further, um, we have the Hudson Housatonic Recovery um, Unit that goes includes um, New York, uh, Massachusetts, <laughs> Connecticut, and down into New Jersey. There is the Outer Coastal Plain Recovery Unit that's uh, specifically in New Jersey, and then. Pennsylvania takes part in the, um, the Delaware Recovery Unit and the Susquehanna Potomac Recovery Unit. So in the recovery plan, 
there was, um, uh, they counted and presented how many extant or currently known uh, bog turtle populations there were um, by state and by recovery unit. And you can see here that um, the total of all of these was at that time 350, keeping in mind that for us, for the turtle to meet the recovery criteria, there need to be 185 of those 350 um, that um, are, are stable and increasing and protected as well. Um, so you can see here in Pennsylvania, we had a 75 of those 350. Now looking at the um, conservation plan that was released this past year, looking again at the um, recovery units. In this case, they took the number of extant populations and they went through a process of uh, ranking the populations in terms of viability for poor, fair, and good. Um, and so it's the good ones that we would be looking for to meet that 185 criteria. And you can see that while the number of populations um, now, let me get this next one up. Um, the number of populations that were 350 at the, at the time of the recovery plan, at, we now have uh, counted up to 500. It's not that the bog turtle has increased that many, it's that, that the definition of population has somewhat changed um, in the, since then. So we're looking about at different terms, as well as the fact that more populations have in fact been found. Um, which is a good thing. Um, but looking at Pennsylvania specifically, if you want to look at what Pennsylvania is contributing to those good, um, uh, good populations, um, we've got 12 out of the 21 in Delaware recovery unit and five of the 24 in the Susquehanna Potomac. If you look at the poor site, um, we have quite a few more, 33 out of 68 and 84 out of 50. So now, not only do we have those, um, the recovery plan and the conservation plan, there are other documents um, that have recently come out or that are being worked on that have a great deal of useful information. Um, one of them was uh, is the Intraservice Programmatic Biological Opinion for Bog Turtle Habitat Restoration um, that was issued uh, last year. And what that uh, programmatic biological opinion does is covers for habitat restoration activities in which the Fish and Wildlife Service um, has a federal nexus. So that's either doing the work, uh, funding the work, permitting the work, uh, and uh, incidental take is uh, covered in that. Where there is also a programmatic biological opinion for uh, PennDOT activities, um, and that has uh, recently come out and is now being implemented. Um, the first BO is uh, range-wide uh, for the northern population, uh, all the states um, that is used, whereas the uh, PennDOT is obviously just in Pennsylvania. In progress right now, we have um, and have for, for over a decade now a regional team of service and state uh, agency bog turtle lead biologists who are on monthly calls and keep each other updated as to what's going on. Uh, folks from the southern population also often join us on that call so that we're keeping in communication to learn what's going on with the southern population. The um, a subset of that group is working on the service uh, species status assessment for the bog turtle, and that should be out in the next year or so. And really good news is that um, uh, another Comp SWIG grant was awarded uh, just this past spring, uh, 29, 2019 funding for several years to actually implement the conservation plan that was produced through the first comp swig. And both of these grants, um, uh, big kudos go to Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission for leading the charge in terms of coordination with all the other states on that implementation. 
And I just want to emphasize here again that um, because the states are now working with funding towards implementation of the conservation plan, this is really a place where all partners can participate um, in various um, actions within um, this conservation plan that will be uh, really moving forward in the next couple of years, starting this year, though uh, delayed a bit through because of COVID. All right, I'm going to quickly run through here um, seasonal activities and habitats. In the winter, uh, bog turtles are found in root balls with springs. They don't necessarily go completely hibernate. They move around underground, and these hibernacula are often communal, communal uh, with uh, uh, other turtles, and they're returned return to year after year. In the spring, they're going to start moving um, out um, from their hibernacula to forage, mate, bask, and to nest. And they're using a number of different uh, types of habitats uh, within the wetlands and connecting the wetlands. And then in July, it gets hot. They are not as active unless it rains when they do some, some dispersal. And in June, uh, nests are laid and they incubate throughout the summer and hatch uh, between late August and early October. Uh, in order to identify bog turtle habitat, um, there is guidance, we call it phase one um, habitat assessment. Uh, guidance and data sheets uh, are provided. It was recently updated um, uh, in 2020, uh, the data sheets. And it is, uh, it's these data sheets that are submitted to us when we are doing project reviews to know whether there is potential bog turtle habitat involved or not. Um, now, we look at, are particularly interested in if that uh, habitat assessment was done by somebody who is on a list of qualified bog turtle surveyors. Um, these are folks that are on a list with uh, document, documented experience of finding turtles. They uh, are well um, experienced with knowing the macro and micro habitats of bog turtles. And this list is updated and maintained by Fish and Boat Commission. And um, we both use it in terms of um, understanding the level of experience of the person that's submitting um, these uh, phase one habitat assessments. And if they do use them, um, it, they often can sign off and get through the um, process much quicker uh, in, with service review through the through PACE and their PINDI uh, receipt. There are three basic habitat characteristics common to bog turtle habitat. Again, the hydrology based on springs, making the substrate very mucky um, with uh, various forms of vegetation. In this slide, you can see what looks like an emergent uh, wetland. Uh, it actually was a forested and scrub shrub wetland until uh, some restoration took place and trees were cut and removed. The pink flag shows where a bog turtle is hibernating. They could hibernate fine there even if it was forested. But now the habitat is open and available for uh, foraging and nesting as well. Um, but to get a little trickier, uh, there's a bog turtle hibernating here, too. You can't really see much water, although there's a, a bit of an upwelling, a spring underneath that fallen tree that becomes a, a little creek. Um, and there are turtles down there in mucky soils um, uh, along with the, with the spring action, uh, keeping them from freezing and having a well-oxygenated place to spend the winter. And even this, uh, at the base of this tree, uh, where you can't see any water, but if you put your hand down in a hole between the roots, you will find cold flowing water and bog turtles. Now, once the, once the snow melts, it gets to warm up. The turtles will come up to the surface and uh, bask during the day and then go back down at night. Um, don't know if you can see here. And I'm going to try to pull back this annotation tool again, if I can. Uh, there we go. And uh, there's four turtles here. Uh, you may not be able to see them. There, this is what's called basking cryptically. There's a turtle here. 
There's a turtle here. You can see its head, its foot, its shell. There is a turtle going this direction. You can see the scoots on the shell. And then there's another one tucked underneath there. This is often when mating takes place. They can find each other pretty easily this stage of the game. So next is, if I can get this to click again. Um, stop. Come on. Sorry. It's not. All right. So they're going to move out into uh, the emergent areas of the wetland where they can get full sun after the um, after uh, the leaves come out. And you can see there's rivulets with mucky uh, substrate throughout these um, throughout this emergent area. And you can see here in this particular wetland the emergent area is starting to be taken over by some invasive. Um, and there is a footpath here that's um, established by deer, but humans can use it when they're studying turtles or surveying. And um, you also get this kind of path when you have cows grazing within a wetland. And what happens is that um, not only uh, as, as this vegetation gets denser, um, these corridors become easier for the turtles to find uh, muck and open canopy and no resistance to moving around within the wetland. Uh, you see a rivulet here with a very small plastic um, hummock within, and it's very low to the ground. It's one of the reasons we get uh, nervous about people being in wetlands in the summer, because uh, even that small hummock right there could be uh, a nest, and we don't want folks stepping on them. Um, you can see this turtle has just laid two. They lay between one and five eggs, um, an average of three. You can see the twig uh, to, the, to the left of this female. And in this next photo, you can see the twig again. Uh, she's covered up the nest, and you can't see the eggs at all within the sphagnum. When they hatch later, uh, between uh, late August, uh, September, Sometimes into October, um, if it's not been, if it's been a rainy, cold summer, uh, these guys come out. They're very small. Um, as this one is just a few days old. Uh, yolk plug has been um, pretty much used up, but you can still see its egg tooth. So let's move on. Threats. The recovery plan identifies threats uh, in some large categories: uh, adverse changes to habitat inadequacy of existing regulatory mechanisms, and illegal collection and trade, as well as disease and predation. Uh, when the meeting took place in 2011, um, all the participants um, were uh, coming up with a new list of threats uh, and much more specific within recovery units. And you can see those lists within the conservation plan. And this is what, one of the things that it looks like. They then ranked these threats uh, by uh, recovery unit. And you can see um, that the top risks are development, succession, uh, invasives uh, are, are clearly the top three. And before I hand it over to Nicole, if she gets ready, I um, wanted you to take a look at this slide and see how many threats you can identify for this particular Pennsylvania turtle. Nicole, it's all yours. Thank you, Allison. <laughs> You're welcome. There you go. All right, I'm just sharing my screen. Are you able to see it yet? My presentation? Yes, yeah, please. Yeah. Okay. Well, I want to thank you for having us here today to talk about bob turtle conservation. Thanks, Allison, Allison, for that wonderful background on life history and habitat. I'm Nicole Renali, Endangered Species Biologist with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. I just want to give you a brief background on the Endangered Species Program with the Fish and Wildlife Service and where the bog turtle fits in. We have three main roles um, within our program. 
proactive conservation, such as nest box programs for bluebirds and kestrels. Um, without those programs, who knows, those species could have required protection from the Endangered Species Act. Um, we also work with people and agencies to avoid and minimize impacts to endangered species. Um, this can be done on a project-by-project project basis or at the programmatic level, as Allison touched base on in the previous presentation, like PennDOT's programmatic consultation and the Interest Service Section 7 consultation for restoration actions. And lastly, um, helping to improve populations so the species can be removed from the Endangered Species Act. Um, one prime example of this is the American alligator which the numbers were so low due to overharvesting and habitat loss that they were almost extinct. In 1987, they were considered fully recovered. So I would be remiss if I discussed federally endangered species without at least mentioning the Endangered Species Act. The intent of the act is to protect and recover listed species and their ecosystems. This basically boils down to the fact that it's unlawful to take illicit animal without a permit. A study by Greenwald and All in 2019 assessed the effectiveness of the Endangered Species Act in protecting and recovering species and found a total of 39 species have been fully recovered, including 23 in the past 10 years. And through protective measures, they concluded that the ESA has prevented the extinction of 291 species since its passage in 73, um, saving more than 99% of the species that are under its protection. So two more examples of species that have been removed from the list are the bald eagle and the Kirkland's warbler. The Kirkland's warbler was delisted just last year. So when the bog turtle was listed in 1997, it was actually listed with a special rule called a 4D rule. This allows the service to establish special regulations specific to threatened species. So the 4D rule does not um, take into account endangered species. It's, it's only used for threatened species. In the case of bog turtles, the 4D rule exempts take violations associated with moving turtles out of roads, and it allows light to moderate grazing to occur within known bog turtle habitat. So while picking up a turtle is considered harassment, therefore it's considered take, the take is not prohibited because during the listing period, it was determined that it benefits the species, that people would be able to move turtles out of roads. And um, a rule of thumb when it comes to moving turtles out of the road, just a sidebar, and pretty much any herp that you might find in a road is to always move them in the direction that they were moving. So if the turtle's moving to the right in the middle, but it's in the middle of the road, keep moving it to the right just off the road. Of course, only do so if it's safe. Um, and if you're able to get a picture of the turtle and a GPS coordinate, we would always appreciate that. Send that to the service and the Fish and Boat Commission. Uh, and the grazing rule, the grazing 4D rule, is based on the presumption at the time of listing that in the past, native grazers like bison and elk in the past have probably filled that niche to keep the habitat open. Um, it's also presumed or probable that periodic fires would go through these, these uh, wetlands to keep um, the area open and allow sunlight to reach the understory. So protecting individuals, populations, and habitat through consultation is done slightly differently depending on the entity that consults. I think Allison touched base on this when she talked about the federal nexus. Every entity, whether federal or non-federal, follows the Endangered Species Act. However, the manner of how they follow the law depends on whether they're a federal agency or a non-federal agency. So when conducting a project, granting a permit, or authorizing an action, the federal agency must consult with the service to ensure that they are not jeopardizing the continued existence of a federally listed species. Again, non-federal partners also follow the Endangered Species Act, and do, to do so, we provide technical assistance, which involves recommendations. 
Both entities can screen their projects through the Conservation Explorer website is up here. Um, they may get immediate clearance through, through using this website, or they may receive an avoidance measure, such as a time of year restriction, or the receipt may advise that they send the project in for further guidance. One such example of a commonly seen project in our office is the replacement of culverts. Um, municipalities, agencies, and individuals are assessing their role in contributing to a healthier watershed by restoring flow in old, undersized culverts. Oftentimes, project proponents are replacing these bottlenecks with larger culverts and bridges, and it allows the water to flow more naturally and helps prevent overtopping and erosion issues. Even though this project has the potential to improve habitat for aquatic, semi-aquatic, and wetland species, it also has the potential to disturb bog turtles. So once the project is screened in Conservation Explorer, um, the project will be sent to our office where it's assessed by a biologist. It's important to note that the whole project is assessed, including staging areas, impacts to flow, and impacts to adjacent wetlands. We welcome all projects and especially welcome those that have the ability to improve water quality, increase food, the food base for the turtles, but there are chances that the turtle could be affected directly or indirectly through crushing, disturbance during nesting, or feeding, or while dispersing. So therefore, on projects like this, we work with individuals and agencies on how to avoid impacts to turtles and their habitat. So in this scenario, let's assume that it's in an area potentially containing bog turtles. Although bog turtles spend most of their life in wetlands, they will use streams to disperse to new habitats. Um, streams also provide a safe connection between habitats and populations. Um, rather, we prefer them using streams to crossing roads. So we like to have um, nice restored stream in between um, bog turtle habitats to provide corridors. So a phase one survey would be done. Even if wetlands are not directly adjacent to the work area, we want all habitat within 300 feet of the project area to be mapped, along with the project features, in order to better understand possible impacts to the wetland or the turtle in relation to the habitat and the turtle's needs. So the 300-foot buffer um, is, it came from the the fact that it's considered an area that's critical to the bog turtle, the 300-foot buffer outside of the wetland, that may aid in dispersal and it, it most likely aids in the hydrological inputs to the wetland. Um, so after the phase one survey is done, there's basically two options. You can either, if it's a positive survey, if, if the habitat does come back with um, being positive for uh, bog turtles. You can either assume the turtles are there and just avoid impact, or you can have a phase two survey done by a qualified bog turtle surveyor. So while a phase one survey identifies wetland suitability for bog turtles, a phase two is actually a survey searching for bog turtles. If the results of the phase two indicate that turtles are not likely present, then the project can go forward without any avoidance measures. If turtles are present, we recommend um, avoidance measures, and occasionally we might ask for, you know, the project to be tweaked. So most of the time, we are able to move forward with just avoidance and minimization measures, but rarely impacts can't be avoided, so the action agency will begin the process of acquiring approval for a limited amount of take through the consultation process. So a programmatic consultation, as we mentioned earlier, is a consultation addressing an agency's multiple actions on a program. It's a win-win for the species and the agency. It has the ability to streamline the consultation process, greatly shortening the wait time that would be are required when consulting on individual projects. And it puts forth the conservation actions and avoidance measures by project type, so it actually simplifies, simplifies it for people. 
they can um, create a, a checklist basically telling you, okay, if you're doing this project type, here's your avoidance measures. So there's a lot less back and forth between agencies. It, it makes the process a lot more simple. So as Allison mentioned, the Interest Service Section 7 consultation program covers our um, partners program. It covers any, um, any project that the service has a federal nexus. So if we're doing the work or if we're, we um, have given money to somebody to do work in a bog turtle wetland, this covers us. It also covers the refuges. Um, it's very different from the previous version. So if you have only seen the previous version of, of the consultation, I, I recommend, I put the, the website up here, I recommend you go on our website and look at this one. It's a really good example if you're interested in pursuing a programmatic with the service. So basically it allows a certain amount of take which facilitates the conservation of the species as a whole. Um, this particular one, the, this uh, interest service one, can help put short-term impacts to individuals into perspective when looking at recovering pop, whole populations and species as a, whole, as a whole. So it allows you to see the big picture rather than just project by project. So the other purpose of the Endangered Species Act is recovery. This could never happen without cooperation between agencies, private citizens, zoos, aquariums, universities, non-governmental organizations to move the needle towards recovery. Um, Section 7A1 of the Endangered Species Act is so important because um, it encourages federal agencies to use their power basically to help recover species. And one of the reasons it's so important is because agencies like the Department of Defense manage 30 million acres in the United States. And that can and has been used to help recover species. So it allows agencies to be a partner in the recovery of a species within the scope of their mission statement. It doesn't supersede their main mission, but it works within the framework. NRCS is a huge partner in the recovery of the bog turtle. They have programs for private landowners to help conserve and restore habitat. And such programs are so important because um, the majority of bog turtle habitat in Pennsylvania is on private property. So one such program that NRCS has been a drive, which has been a driver in wetland conservation for the species is the Wetland Reserve Easement Program. This is a voluntary agreement which allows landowners to retain title, quiet enjoyment, and control of access, but it restricts certain activities on the easement. Wetland restoration is a key component to the Wetland Reserve Easement Program. It could involve restoring the ecosystem function through overstory tree removal, managing cattails, restoring hydrology, and managing exotics. And Word of mouth is, is hugely effective with this program. It's kind of, uh, I want one of those two thing. It kind of catches in areas. Um, currently, there's about a little less than 1,500 acres in this easement program in Pennsylvania. So this area is maintained in perpetuity for bog turtles, which is huge. So as I said, restoration is a key component to the WRE program. This is where the service comes in. The service provides a plan to NRCS for the restoration of the WRE site. Sometimes restoration of the landscape involves looking through old aerials and getting an idea of what the landscape can support. It is also prudent to understand the bog turtle habitat in adjacent areas and the manner in which that habitat responds to disturbance. Overall, the goal is to get the ecosystem functioning in early to mid-successional stage and to maintain a mosaic of habitats for turtles. So quickly about management plans. In order to effectively restore the habitat and the ecosystem function, the Fish and Wildlife Service writes a plan for an initial treatment. In order to conduct habitat management in the presence of turtles, we specify time of year for certain activities, especially in the core nesting habitat. Most of the time, the restoration will create nesting and basking habitat 
and by removing excess trees that may be stifling the movement of water in the system, you may be able to actually increase the amount of monkey soils available to turtles, which, as you can see in this first photo, helps provide refuge. So while do, but cap, one caveat is while doing the, the tree mid-story removal, it's important to keep in mind the need to maintain enough woody plant species to provide adequate area for hibernacula now and into the future. So you don't want to just blast the whole site. You want to make sure you're maintaining a mosaic. Another one of NRCS's programs that has been beneficial to bog turtles in Pennsylvania is EQUIP. The service's role in this program is to work with NRCS staff to find ways to conduct the work while avoiding and minimizing adverse effects to the turtles and other listed species like bats. NRCS, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission also offer technical assistance to landowners who may be interested in restoration or may want surveys done at their site. U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service's role in this is as a guest on private land. We don't enter the land unless we are invited or unless we ask for and receive permission. So I get a lot of questions about um, if I have turtles, are you allowed to just come onto my property? And the answer is no. I have to get permission and or I have to be asked to come. If the landowner is interested in restoration, um, I just wanted to put out there the services program called the Partners for Fish and Wildlife Program. Mark Roberts is the coordinator in Pennsylvania. So if you have any questions or are interested in working um, with Mark, uh, I put his email address up here. And additionally, as far as just wanting technical assistance on um, possible restoration. And our CS office is a great resource, your local office. So in order to continue moving the recovery needle for bog turtles, I urge everyone to assess your role in the recovery of the species. Take the highest threats to the species into account and determine where your agency, organization, or how you as an individual can tackle one or more of these threats. Now that you've learned some about bog turtle habitat, keep an eye out for it. Let us know if you find some. Report turtles to the Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission and to the Fish and Wildlife Service if you find any. Do you manage land in the species range? Are you interested in learning more about um, managing for bog turtles? Are there changes programmatically that can be taken within your agency? Can you communicate with others on how to support bog turtle conservation? Are you located in a county with bog turtles? Can you help control exotics? These are some questions that you can ask yourself concerning your role or the role of your organization in the recovery of the species. In order to protect the turtles, we need to know where the habitat is. As Allison mentioned, we're still finding new turtles, and last year there were actually two new watersheds that were added because new turtles were found in completely different areas that we didn't know we had turtles. So since we're still finding habitat and still finding turtles, um, we, we could use more help. I just want to put a shout out for NRCS staff. They've been really good about connecting me with landowners who are interested in bog turtle surveys or restoration. Um, they're out there meeting people, seeing habitat, and have good rapport with the community. So that's been really helpful. That relationship has been really fruitful. Additionally, I want to put out there, um, we're interested in Organizing information on invasive treatments in wetlands in Pennsylvania. We want to know what works, what doesn't work, and why. What time of year have you found most effective for controlling invasives? What's the chemical type, rate, or volume that showed good results? So if you're interested in contributing information in this, please feel free to send us an email. And we're still looking um, to connect habitats through restoration and easements, and we're still looking to conduct surveys in new areas to identify um, potential new sites. So as I mentioned, recovery is all hands on deck, and know that you're all part of this, and we welcome your input.
And I just wanted to put this up. Um, this was a brochure that PennDOT created. It's an excellent um, outreach for their employees and contractors. And it has their avoidance and minimization measures for bog turtles. Um, if your agency or organization is interested in putting something like this together, please feel free to contact us. We're happy to help you. And I just wanted to put out there um, all the partners that we've worked with. We couldn't have done any of this without them. So um, at this point, I think we're ready for questions, if anyone has any questions from me or Allison. Thanks, Allison, uh, and thank you, Nicole. That's a wonderful uh, presentation this afternoon. Uh, do we have any questions in the chat? No questions in the chat. Okay, we'll give it a minute, see if we have any questions come through the chat. Oh, man. Do we have any questions? Okay. Uh, oh, Tim has one. Oh. No, it's related to WebEx. Okay. Okay. No, Curtis Struckler. Oh, Curtis has one. Yeah. Um, what are bog turtles' natural predators besides collectors? Um, they're primarily. Um, the predation takes primarily um, a dominant uh, threat to bog turtles in the nesting phase. The females are very um, exposed when they are laying their eggs in the evening at the time that raccoons and things are coming out, um, and they kind of go into a bit of a haze while they're laying their eggs. And then the eggs themselves, while they are tucked away in the uh, hummocks, um, they are dug out by a number of different predators, um, as well as, believe it or not, um, ants and grass will actually take over eggs as well. The uh, adults, the, the primary concern about adult mortality, um, as with other turtles, is uh, road mortality. Uh, these guys evolved to, uh, once they had a hard shell, basically survive anything uh, when they pull into the shell. Uh, so they can't compete uh, with our technology in terms of being able to survive. But it's, I would say raccoons are probably the primary uh, natural predator. And while they are a natural predator, they are uh, subsidized by human uh, neighborhoods. And so when you get development near a bog turtle wetland, you're actually increasing the uh, predator pressure on them. And Thank you, Alice. Maya? Yep. Any other questions? Okay. Not seeing any more. Um, very good. So thank you both. Uh, thank you, Allison and Nicole. Great presentation. We appreciate it. Uh, looking forward to continuing our work with, with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. They've been a great partner in this effort. Moving on to technical report. Our next speaker is Melissa Hanner, uh, Resource Soil Scientist for NRCS. Melissa? Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon. I'm going to move straight to the next slide. I just have some brief um, national wetland policy updates I want to just briefly bring to your attention. Um, the first one, on January 23rd, 2020, this year, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency and the Department of the Army finalized the Navigable Waters Protection Rule. NWPR, and um, this does not impact wetland determinations conducted by NRCS. 
for Food Security Act purposes. What it does do is define waters of the United States, or WOTUS, and the scope of federal jurisdiction under the Clean Water Act. It identifies waters and features excluded from the definition of WOTUS, including prior converted cropland, or PC. It describes how EPA and the Army will rely on the USDA PC designation and explains under what circumstances land no longer meets the PC designation for Clean Water Act purposes. So that's the Navigable Protection Water Rule, and that's the Joint Agency Memorandum for Food Security Act and Clean Water Act implementation. So this came afterwards on July 17, 2020, and it's a memorandum between the EPA, Army, and NRCS. The memorandum is to minimize duplica duplication of efforts pursuant to the Clean Water Act and the Food Security Act wetland conservation provisions, and it's to help facilitate agency efforts to administer federal wetland programs while minimizing their impacts on affected landowners and operators. So in the next slide, um, this memorandum does two things I want you to be aware of. First of all, it establishes a new icon that will be placed on certified wetland determination maps to alert USDA participants of potential Clean Water Act jurisdictional waters on their properties and which may require Clean Water Act permitting if manipulated. So this is a cautionary icon that NRCS is putting on certified wetland determination maps. It's just cautionary. It's not appealable. Our people doing wetland determinations might place the symbol on a blue line stream, an NWI wetland, or an obvious pond or deep ditch in proximity to the tract where they're doing a certified wetland determination. And next slide. The second thing the Joint Agency Memorandum does is it clarifies NRCS may provide Clean Water Act related assistance to USDA clients under limited circumstances. So this assistance will be provided only upon receiving written permission from the USDA client. And this assistance is limited to um, sharing the technical information of a certified wetland determination. And these um, determinations are used um, to demonstrate the prior converted cropland exclusion for a Section 404 permit. So a release um, is provided as part of the memorandum, and the client may sign the release if they want to have the information or share the certified wetland determination information. It is not um, authorization to just conduct new determinations that aren't based on um, Food Security Act requirements. If one was already created for Food Security Act requirements, then we could share the information if the client requests this. And our next slide. The memorandum has a nice summary here of the prior converted cropland definition as defined by NRCS and also as defined by the Army and EPA. So first of all, the Food Security Act definition, which we use for NRCS certified wetland determinations, is a conversion that occurred prior to December 23, 1985. A commodity was produced at least once, and the converted wetland did not support woody vegetation as of December 23, 1985, and the PC area did not meet hydrologic criteria for a farmed wetland. This is a little bit different from the Army Corps and EPA definition for the Clean Water Act and the Navigable Water Protection Rule. They agree that it's a conversion that was drained or otherwise manipulated for the purpose 
of making production of an ag agricultural product possible. The EPA and CORE recognize designations of PC made by the USDA. An area is no longer considered PC for the purposes of Clean Water Act when the area is abandoned and the area is reverted to wetlands. Those two things make a PC definition no longer recognized for Clean Water Act purposes. So abandonment by the Clean Water Act definition is when PC is no longer used to support agricultural purposes at least once in the preceding five years. And for Clean Water Act purposes, the EPA administrator has the final authority to determine whether the converted cropland has been abandoned. So it's just really nice that they have this in writing, what our PC definitions are and how they support each other but also diverge. I'm going to go to the next slide. Um, also part of our National Wetland Policy Update, there is a final rule for highly erodible land and wetland conservation that was published August 28, 2020. For the most part, that it confirms all the information from the 2018 interim final rule. It took into account a lot of public comment on that interim rule. Um, in addition, it really just clarifies and re-emphasizes these four points here. Um, the USDA will make a reasonable effort to include an infected person on an on-site investigation where there's a potential um, Food Security Act violation. It clarifies that um, how wetland hydrology indicators are used for the determination of farm wetlands and farm wetland pasture. It clarifies the term best drained condition, which is used in um, identifying a prior converted cropland designation. And it also um, provides clarity and emphasis Relocating um, the wetland determinations can be done on a tract, field, or subfield basis, and when those different levels of a determination would be made. So these are the quick highlights of the final rule. But what I need your input or you to think about is on the next slide. As part of the final rule, attention, State Technical Committee, the final rule directs NRCS to identify the wetland hydrology indicators used in the determination of farmed wetlands in the local NRCS field office tech guide. And in particular, the final rule is looking for clarity on farm wetland indicators that are not Playa Pocosin or Pothole wetlands and farm wetland pasture. These have a slightly different hydrologic um, indicator definition. Those types of wetlands, the farm wetland pasture and the playa pothole and pocosin type, if they meet wetland hydrology, if they're in the right um, landform and land use, they are, they um, meet the definition of that wetland type. Farm wetlands are a little bit different. So um, NRCS is expected to review this at a local level, and if within six months of publishing the final rule, this August rule, the local, um, state, or regional group is supposed to publish our indicators that we use for farm wetlands. So on the next page, NRCS um, currently, prior to this rule, the law requires us to use the hydrology indicators from the regional supplements of the 1987 Corps Manual. This was found to be um, problematic to use another agency's materials in the event that agency would revise their indicators without consideration of the impact on our Food Security Act wetland determination process. So, 
the final rule removes our requirement of using the regional supplements for hydrology indicators and instead instructs us to identify which indicators we're using and post them in the NRCS field office technical guide. So the next slide. Um, here at the state office, our um, team working in compliance and um, in addition to whatever input and consultation that can be provided locally through the state technical committee, we are going to um, review the supplements, highlight in particular which are the hydrology indicators that we are using to um, meet that farm wetland definition. And the farm wetland definition as described in the law is inundation or ponding for 15 consecutive days or more during the growing season in most years or 10% of the growing season in most years, whichever is less. So um, thank you for your attention and um, please contact me if you would be interested in reviewing or providing input on our farm wetland hydrology indicators. Um, we will be bringing this back to your attention again at the next meeting of the State Technical Committee for review prior to publishing this to the field office technical guide. And if you should have um, additional questions, you can review the NRCS conservation compliance page or you should feel free to contact me here in the Harrisburg State Office. That is all, thank you. I missed a question from the bog turtle presentation from John Bell. John Bell asked if he could have some perspective and context for the information being provided through these presentations and criteria for administration of NRCS and NRCS programs. Well, I think the, the administration and the context of our the bog turtle, John, is basically the we we spend um, significant amount of funds. We have about 85 bog turtle easements at this point in time, uh, maybe possibly nearing 100. So um, that is a huge source of our easement funding. Um, it is part of many things that we do. Um, we we, of course, work with agricultural producers, but we also work to restore wetlands. So in context of uh, the bog turtle, we, we have a very active program of restoration and work hand in hand with um, Fish and Wildlife Service. In addition to that, um, as a federal agency, we are required uh, by law to, to do con consultation with Fish and Wildlife Service as it relates to the bog turtle. So anytime we are in a bog turtle area on a farm, um, we, we need to consult with Fish and Wildlife Service um, to make sure that we're not disturbing its habitat or having an, any impact on the population. Uh, Jim, do you want to have anything else to add on the bog turtle? Uh, no, just that, you know, being as it is a federally listed species as a threatened species, that all of our actions, um, even, if, even if we're not automatically in a bog turtle wetland, all of our actions have to be reviewed to make sure that even upslope activities won't negatively affect their habitat or the populations themselves. Um, even though we're a federal agency, we still fall under the same rules and guidelines as everyone else. Um, we do have a little bit of leeway since we are so active with the Fish and Wildlife Service when it comes to bog turtles that we can do some no effect waivers and things like that internally. Uh, but for the most part, we're treated just like everyone else and we have to um, check for and, and avoid whatever we can any sort of damage or take to the species. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? No other questions. Thank Any you. Any questions on Melissa's presentation? All right. Thank you, Tim. Appreciate that. Um, moving on, as part of our portfolio, one of the other things that we have um, in NRCS's uh, programs basket is the 
watershed rehabilitation program. In Pennsylvania, we have about 80 dams uh, that NRCS has um, built over since probably the late 50s, throughout the 60s and 70s. And um, at this point in time, those dams are coming to the end of their life. Um, they, many of them are gracefully aging, and we don't have many issues, but some of them are undersized um, due to uh, new, new criteria. That could be undersized spillways um, for the most part. And so we are in the process of restoring those dams one by one. And uh, it's, it's a task, it's a monumental task, and we do that in partnership with a local sponsor. So with that said, I'm going to turn it over to Heather Smelt, our um, engineer uh, on staff um, that led this uh, Hibernia Dam project. Heather? Thank you, Denise. Um, as Denise said, we've been tackling rehabilitation of our dams one by one. Uh, this one's kind of fun because it's the first one that we've done since about 2010 for rehabilitation. So we're gearing up the program again moving forward. I wanted to quickly tell you the success story or the rehabilitation story of, of Hibernia Dam. So Hibernia Dam is located in the Brandywine Creek watershed in Chester County. It's located right outside of Coatesville. Um, it was built in 1994, was one of the last dams that Pennsylvania built through the program. And the local sponsor, besides the county commissioners, but the main owners of the dam is the Chester County Water Resources Authority. Um, I may also refer to them as CCWRA throughout the presentation. And it was built with three primary purposes. The first was flood protection for uh, the folks downstream. The second was to incorporate water supply. And the third was a recreation uh, purpose associated with the dam. So the dam itself is about 60, almost 65 feet long, and that's located in the top left portion of the picture. I'm sorry, the dam height is 60, almost 65 feet high. The length is 700 feet long. Um, you have the auxiliary spillway, which in high floods or high storm events would see flow over toward the right. Uh, it has the capacity to hold about 257 million gallons of flood water before releasing downstream. And it's currently sized and designed to hold 382 million gallons of water supply storage. And with all this incorporated, the current lake size with that water supply and the recreation component is about 94 acres in size. So it's a great spot. It's located in Hibernia County Park. Um, it's a great spot to go fishing, uh, kayaking, canoeing, things along those lines. So some of the components that led to rehabilitation. Um, one item when we did our assessments to determine that the dam needed to be rehabilitated was that if the auxiliary spillway ever saw flow, based on the existing bedrock conditions, a head cut was going to start and work its way upstream and eventually make it up through the auxiliary spillway and breach the dam, releasing that flood pool down below. So what we ended up doing is simply burying a concrete cutoff wall a part of the way across the auxiliary spillway to where we had competent bedrock that would not erode. And you can see a rendering of it in this photo of what uh, the, final, uh, the final picture is gonna look like once everything greens up, that you just see this little strip of the wall sticking out. So construction on this started in about um, June, June, July timeframe. And when the whole wall got dug out, the hole for the wall, this is what it looked like. This is if you'd be standing on the embankment of the auxiliary of the main dam crest facing the outside, looking at the hole. And I do need to thank Chester County Water Resources Authority for a bunch of these photos. They used their drone and were able to get some really neat photos of construction. So this is the wall excavated out, the wall hole. We came in and leveling out a pad, poured backfill concrete up to a level pad, and then drilled in those grout anchors that you see on the right photo and sunk those in, which went five feet below grade. And then that, those grout anchors are um, 
sunk into confident bedrock and will end up tying into the footer of the concrete wall to tie the entire structure together. Here's a photo, a really cool drone photo of the concrete trucks pouring the footer and placing that footer concrete. And in this photo, you can see that the wall is up. They're removing the forms. And then that wall sat wet um, and was cured for two weeks before we could put, before we could start backfilling and earth filling around it. So then we started earth filling evenly on both sides, building it up. We had strict uh, compaction requirements that we had to follow. And when it was all said and done, this is standing on the top or toward the top, and you can see that little strip down the wall in the center. Um, if you can see my mouse, uh, where that strip is, and that's the top of that wall. The rest of it is completely buried. So that was one component of the rehabilitation. The next component was all work on the downstream slope, on the back slope of the dam. Um, there was some seepage issues that we weren't sure where the seepage was coming from. So to address those, we had two main uh, two main rehabilitations that we did. We extended and improved the spilder toe down at the bottom of the dam, and then we regraded this mid-slope bench to make sure that it would not hold any kind of surface water, improving the drainage, allowing it to shed water so that nothing, no uh, surface runoff would percolate into the dam and possibly be coming out down below. And here's some aerials of beginning that excavation of the rock filter toe and some of the staging that occurred down below. The light material here is sand and the darker material is um, an, of a coarse drain fill stone, like a Ashto 57, or num sorry, it's number eight, number eight stone. And then we also did a wetland crossing right here as part of an access road to allow the county to get in and service the dam. We went in and regraded that bench, and here's a photo of trying to split, uh, starting some of the excavation, removing some riffraff that was in there and beginning that slope. And back to that drain fill at the toe, you can see over toward the left side, this lighter color stone material here, they finished the drain in this area with a final coat of riffraff. You can see the excavation out moving over to the right of it, the fine sand going on top of that, and there's number eight, that course number eight going on top, and then finally the riffraff will go on top of that. The material, the excavated material that was hauled out of the backslip of the dam for the silver toe went up to the area of the bench, and you can see the piles here, and just got regraded in to the bench that way. And here's just a nice picture of them working their way across, smoothing that bench, as well as working down with the toe. And eventually they just worked their way across the toe, and in this picture everything is almost completed. Um, you can see the access road coming in from down below. That was finished as part of the process. You can get a hint of the, uh, the ENS that was done and the, the seating and the netting. You can see little bits of green starting to come up in the toe area. There's a little bit of stone coming across that bench, a finer stone to choke out the riprap to allow equipment to come up top to service uh, the valve vault where the water supply controls are located at the dam. And here's some more, another picture of the bench, uh, seating completed and the blankets, the erosion control blankets installed with some of the pedometers that are on the dam adjusted. So what everyone really cares about, while the pictures are cool, they're really more curious about the numbers. Um, this dam, this rehabilitation was completed through the PLA 3566 Watershed Rehabilitation Program. Construction on it took about four months. So the public was not able to use this part of the park for about four months. Uh, it cost about a million dollars. Uh, the final numbers aren't in, so I'm using about for all the numbers that I'm showing you. 
basically almost 4,000 cubic yards of excavation, 80 some yards of backfill concrete, 76 cubic yards of reinforced concrete for that wall and footer. We were looking at 850 cubic yards of riprap that was placed and about 1,400 ton of drain fill aggregate that went in for this dam. And that would be the end of my talk. Um, I, if, I would be happy to answer any questions that come up or pass on to the next person. Thanks, Heather. Do we have any questions for Heather? No questions in the chat. Okay. Uh, just, just an FYI for folks, we have probably about a little more than a half dozen of different dams, um, actually almost a dozen, dozen yeah. actually when you look at the planning phases. Um, that are in the plan, planning phase, the design phase, or potentially going into a construction phase. So uh, this is a, kind of a, a large workload for NRCS uh, that we actually do a lot of uh, contracting to, uh, of course, engineering firms to do this work for us, but we have oversight of it. So, um, you know, this is um, what's happened uh, congressionally is that this program has come back into popularity um, with a lot of uh, rural flooding. Um, this is a proactive approach for communities to look at potentially um, putting in um, some either flood control structures. Um, and so, uh, you know, as we look at some of our northeastern areas and north central areas that are really prone to flooding, this is an opportunity for folks to consider um, that kind of work under the PL 566 program. It's also not just a dam building program, it's a land treatment program. And we are using PL 566 right now to um, one, look at removing legacy sediments in the Chickies Creek watershed, and two, um, also looking at potential work um, in Chester County with um, spent mushroom compost substrate. So, um, and incinerating that and store, actually storing it on non-ag land. So, um, with that said, there's opportunities for communities and, and partners to think about the, um, using this program. Uh, Congress has um, probably put in about $150 million a year for this. Um, we don't know how long that will last, um, but Pennsylvania is uh, indeed trying to take advantage of that. Um, and for uh, flood control purposes, we also have um, a, one in the west and one in the northeast um, to, to look at potential using this program for flood control. So I um, want to thank everybody uh, for your, their interest. And did we have any more questions on that, Kim, while I was talking? No other questions. Okay. That's it. All right. Thank you, everybody. Okay, moving on. Um, I'm proud to introduce uh, Dan Ludwig, our new state resource conservationist. He is the new Dan Rossi, um, and he is he is taking over the reins of managing uh, our ecological sciences division. And Dan comes to us uh, from the uh, southeast and south central uh, region of the state. Um, Dan was active with Food Security Act compliance, um, wetland restoration and his former life um, was grazing specialist. So Dan's very active with um, many, many things, agriculture as well as uh, wetlands. So welcome, Dan, and I'll turn it over to you. Uh, thank you, Denise. Uh, I feel a little underprepared. Nobody told me they were doing these fancy presentations, but uh, I'll, keep it, I'll keep it brief so we may, may be able to give you some of your, your time back today. Uh, just a few things that I wanted to share with you as far as conservation practices. Uh, we have posted updates to the 590 nutrient management standard. Uh, Mark Goodson worked on that. Uh, we've also updated our uh, pest management standard 595. It actually went through a name change, so instead of being integrated pest management, it is now named pest management conservation system. And we do have a plethora of conservation practices that, it'll, that we will be updating over the next year or so, two years. Um, so as, as you keep coming to 
these meetings will have, will slowly be trickling out these practices uh, for review. Uh, one of the big, big ones we have right now, some of them are going through some name changes. So uh, our practice standard 512, formerly known as forage and biomass planting, has now reverted back to its former name, pasture and hayland planting. So um, one of the things that was probably mentioned before I came on board last year was the rollout of CART uh, for our assessment and how we're doing conservation planning. So uh, we are still sticking with that system. You know, obviously with a new system, we're seeing updates. So uh, for our conservation planners across the state, uh, we are looking at streamlining some of how our business methods and how we're uh, selecting our resource concerns for assessment and obviously the guidance that goes with that. And uh, also we are looking at providing some training opportunities for our staff this fall yet. So coming up uh, in November, we're going to have our annual introduction to conservation planning training for new employees in Lebanon and also our certified planner update meeting for all of our experienced certified planners. Um, so with that, that was kind of my brief update for everybody and maybe I'll have a snazzy presentation for everybody next time. Very good. Thank you, Dan. <laughs> Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Um, with that said, uh, I'm going to introduce Amanda Coleman. Amanda is acting in, um, for the Assistant State Conservationist for Programs and Amanda is uh, her her real job is uh, working in the, as the area resource conservationist in our Bloomsburg office handling all the contracts, uh, whether it be CFT, AMA, or um, EQIP contracts, as well as uh, overseeing some, some prep work. So uh, Amanda, thank you for joining us and for everyone's benefit, Amanda is um, filling in um, after Barry France retired. So he retired uh, September 30th. So. With that said, Amanda, can you hear us okay? Yeah, I can hear you. Thanks, Denise. Um, good, Thank morning. You. good morning. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I also have a short presentation. Um, we are still, we're just gearing up for EQIP and uh, the final rule will be published uh, next week on that. So, um, but I did, did just want to point out a few of the accomplishments from last year and uh, a few changes that we know are in uh, um, mix for this year, for 2021. Okay, Tim, you can advance slide. Um, okay, for the Environmental Quality Incentive Program, oh, you can just go to the next slide. I pretty much said that. <laughs> okay, for the uh, for 2020 final AMA equip funding, um, we did a total of 24 million nine hundred eighty-two thousand two hundred seventy-eight dollars and um, 53,093 acres um, was conservation was applied to. Um, this is a very, uh, for everyone, a very challenging year uh, for a lot of reasons, uh, for our new system that we had to work with and for the COVID. So uh, we managed to stay right on track though with our obligations and get everything obligated by the end of the year. So um, I, I, in my area and probably the whole uh, state of Pennsylvania, I'm, I'm very proud of the work that we did last year, getting through all the hurdles that we had to do. Okay, uh, you can ex you can go to the next slide, Tim. Um, the equip fund pools for 2021 are going to remain largely the same. Uh, we do have two new fund pools: uh, the wildlife terrestrial pollinator fund pool and the urban agriculture fund pool. And I'm going to be going over that more in detail in the next few slides. Okay, next one. Um, the program application deadlines this year, we just passed our EQIP and AMA round one application sign up. That was October 16th, 2020. Um, the EQIP Urban Agricultural Fund round one application sign up is December 18th, 2020. And I'll, again, I'll be reviewing that here shortly. So um, our, our signups generally run um, round one, the third week in third week in October, and round two will be the usually the third week in November. So that's how the rounds run, run every 
um, third week of the month is a new round. Okay, you can expand the slide. Okay, for, so for the wildlife fun pools, uh, through the new Farm Bill 2018, um, it was written in the rules policy to uh, try to dedicate 10% of the funds to wildlife. So for fiscal year 2021, um, we have several existing fund pools that already are dedicated to wildlife, and those are the Goldwing Warbler, the um, Stream Corridor, the General Equip Fund, and I probably should have added to that um, the forestry. Some of the forestry is uh, geared towards wildlife also. So we do already, but um, in order to encourage more adoption of wildlife friendly um, practices, we are going to have a wildlife fund pool this year with um, the terrestrial wildlife, wildlife practice, um, and it's gonna be geared towards pollinators. Um, Jim has been developing a map for that, the pollinators, and uh, I believe if, if uh, Tim, you, you go to the next slide, we'll have the map here. Okay, so these are gonna be the pollinator areas. And Jim is actually developing um, species mix plantings for each county uh, to make it easiest to, um, when we fund these, different pollinator areas. Okay. You can see some of the different, oh, sorry, you can go back. You can see some of the different um, species that we're gonna be uh, targeting there with like the monarch butterfly and a few other different butterflies in through there and some bumblebees. So uh, according to Jim, there's not a lot known on what the, on some of these species, but um, we're gonna do our best to target those species. Okay, next slide. Um, the other fund pool we have is the Urban Agricultural Fund Pool, and this is gonna be targeting Harrisburg, Philadelphia, Pittsburgh. Um, again, the purpose of this program is to protect natural resources um, while growing fruits and vegetables to try to target some of those food barren areas of um, cities that, uh, we, that have been identified. Uh, the practices that we anticipate mostly being um, funded are the high tunnels or hoop houses, possibly some cover crops, uh, maybe some nutrient management and pollinator planning. Again, this, we have a later sign up deadline for this one. It's December 18th since we just, um, the press release just came out about this. And uh, this urban agricultural areas, this will only be in, within the city limits of Harrisburg, Philadelphia and Pittsburgh. And I believe that that is all I had. So with that, I'm going to give it over to Ashley unless there are questions. Thanks, Thanks Amanda. Any questions for Amanda? In the, okay, all right. And um, uh, thanks to Fish and Wildlife Service for their help um, with helping develop those pollinator maps. They, uh, they were working with Jim uh, to specifically look at some threatened species. Um, are they endangered or threatened, Jim? Most of them are candidates. For Most of them candidates. So, um, so thank you, Jim. Um, moving on to um, Ashley Lennox. Ashley is our CFP coordinator as well as uh, manages the National Water Quality and, um, in Initiative areas and then also helps with our Conservation Initiative grant. So Ashley, we'll turn it over to you. Okay, can you see my screen? Because I'm not sure if I did it right. We, we can see a screen, CSP, SIG, and, and WQI. Yeah. Okay, good. Thank you. And I guess I'm in the right place, on the right screen. Uh, I'm Ashley Lennig, as uh, Denise mentioned, I'm a conservation program manager, and I'm gonna give you an update on the programs that I manage. So here's a little outline of what I'm gonna go over. Conservation stewardship program, we're gonna talk about our accomplishments in fiscal year 2020 as well as our first year activities that we're working on now. We'll talk about uh, what was awarded in 2020 for um, conservation innovation grants. And then we'll talk about uh, National Water Quality Initiative, our results from fiscal year 2020, and just a review of our 
watersheds. So here is the uh, CSP, or Conservation Stewardship Program. You can see we've had multiple um, types or iterations of CSP last year with our new tools, and I think there was some talk about that that was a rather challenging way to test out our new, our new tools with, um, with this particular program that has a threshold requirement to get in, um, it needs to meet a conservation threshold. But we did 22 renewals, um, 122 CSP Classic, which is our regular sign up. And then we have something called the CSP Grassland Conservation Initiative, focuses on grassland areas. <clears throat> so a total for CSP for 2020 was 168 contracts for $5.8 million. And then now we're in the first quarter of uh, fiscal year 2021, so we're working on some of our normal activities. We had a change this year. We, we make our annual payments for CSP, and oftentimes you have a choice of um, which calendar year you'd like to be paid in. But for this, for this, um, for our new 2020 contracts, they need to be paid in in this calendar year, as well as um, folks that would like to be paid in calendar year 2020. So we actually have an earlier than normal deadline for those to be paid. So our field staff are feverishly working on doing these payments and getting them approved by November 6th completing modifications that may be needed in order to process um, an accurate payment. We did release uh, the screen tool for CSP to be used with the renewals and CSP classic um, applications that are coming in. And um, we'll be working on our mandatory resource concern list, which will basically be staying uh, very similar to last year. And that's what we evaluate in our conservation assessment and ranking tool, the CART tool that Dan uh, touched on. Switching gears to conservation innovation grants, we did select four to be funded in fiscal year 2020, um, and those were approved at the end of the fiscal year in September. So um, you can see Penn State University is doing one on promoting soil health and nutrient conservation with manure injection and cover crop interseeding. I think that's um, self-explanatory. And then Team Ag is going to be connecting capital. Uh, their project is entitled Connecting Capital with Pennsylvania Farmers Using Regenerative Farming Practices to draw down carbon. And that one they're going to um, demonstrate the effectiveness of a regenerative farm business plan, uh, looking at economic, environmental performance through improved resilience and sustainability on the farm. And we have Mid-Atlantic 4R Nutrient Stewardship Agriculture. I misspelled something there. Anyhow, um, utilizing nitrogen modeling to determine soil health contributions to nitrogen fertility. So we're looking at that on uh, 400 corn, I'm sorry, 4,000 corn um, acres of corn cropland to compare yields and residual nitrogen levels. And then we have PASA, Pennsylvania Association for Sustainable Agriculture, and they're looking at uh, our alley cropping practice, um, looking at alley cropping with forestry. Then I just wanted to mention under the National Water Quality Initiative, we will be continuing with our five watersheds that we have um, been working with NWQI in, Upper Kishikoquilos Creek, Beaver and Upper Yellow Creek, Warrior Run, and then we have Maiden Creek and Swatera Creek, which are our source water protection pilots. Let me show a map of that right here just so to refresh everyone's memory where they're located. And then I wanted to report, uh, I thought that we had a very successful um, year with uh, those. We used our money in those areas, so we had a total of 33 contracts for over 3.5 million. And in our traditional areas, we had um, 12 over 1 million. And then in the source water protection areas of um, Lebanon and Berks County there in the southeast, um, we exceeded that with 21 contracts for over 2.4 million. So we got some good um, contracts and practices. Uh, we'll be getting on the ground in those, in those targeted watersheds to make water quality improvements. And then actually, I was thinking I'd share one more thing before I take questions. Well, maybe you want to ask questions now while I'm on the next. 
sure, Ashley, we can handle that while you're pulling up the, uh, the map. Yeah, there were two questions, and some of this may go back to Amanda Coleman, too. But the first question comes from John Bell. Does anyone have any idea on level of nutrient and sediment credits generated from AMA, CFT, and EQIP programs in PHSC Bay watershed? We, John, we, we have, of course, the uh, conservation effects assessment project in which we um, examine um, the impact of conservation practices, but on individual practices or the years themselves, we do not. Um, we do have um, what SEEP does is looks at um, what impact our structural practices as well as our um, management practices have had on the landscape. And if you, if you want to see what that, those impacts are, we're more than happy to uh, share those with the staff and we'll do so um, to the audience uh, when we send out the minutes. Also, um, at this point in time, we, we have, um, I think, we also are looking at potentially um, a number series of RCPPs that are not covered here that will have um, impacts on um, nutrient sediment reductions as well. So uh, when you look at all of this, this does feed into the Chesapeake Bay model. All of this information for, for the benefit of the audience, um, all of our practice data is fed into the Bay model. It is delivered in aggregate form, um, generally on a HUC-12 basis if we have uh, less than five points um, in that HUC, it is, it is aggregated and delivered up to the county level. So all of this information is um, put into the CAS model for um, examination of nutrient reduction as well as sediment reduction. So just want to give you an update that there is a measurement. Um, we look at it within the agency um, as a whole using our SEEP um, project. But we also look at it as well as all this data is taken annually and um, delivered to DEP um, for them to update into the model. So, Great. Any other questions? There was one other question from Kathani Kajala. Does nutrient management for urban agriculture include manure, fertilizer application, heavy metals, or only manure management? I think at this point, Kasani, we would follow the nutrient management standard, the 590 standard. And so one of these things that we are looking at and that we're taking input from others at this point in time, um, at the end of this presentation today, we are going to look, talk to urban subcommittees. We are, we're soliciting for urban subcommittee members where we will talk about this very thing um, to, to examine our current standards um, look at them, whether we need to tweak them for urban settings or the job sheets associated with those standards most likely. So um, we will be um, getting input from urban growers as well as those um, that um, have, that represent urban interests. So we're certainly interested in that. And with that said, do, does anybody else at the table have any more to add on that? Okay. All right. Um, moving on. now. Um, uh, Ashley, you want to share your map? Sure. I just wanted to uh, update you on something from um, that occurred in, since the last time we were together. So this is a um, refinement of a source water protection area. So we had already um, submitted a source water protection area map to our national office and it covered the majority of our state. And then we received a bulletin that we have to actually refine this and have it be less than 20%. So we, and this is by HUC-12 watersheds. That was the the requirement. So we were able to, um, you know, we weren't really looking to add a lot of areas, but we were looking to take um, areas away. So we were looking at areas that were heavily forested or heavily urban that um, we wouldn't have an opportunity to do a lot of work in that watershed. Um, uh, we were working with GEP and um, gathering other data, but um, this is what we came up with, with our uh, Source water protection area, so this was the refined map, and it can be used for setting high priorities, like with our rankings, you would get a higher priority if you're doing projects to protect water quality in these watersheds. And, and NRCS uh, is required to 
actually NRCS is required by law to spend 10% in source water protection areas. So this is kind of the map that also tells us whether we're doing our job on that end. There was another, actually there was another question. Okay. <laughs> Ladies first, go ahead. <laughs> Uh, I was just going to say this is also um, can be used for our um, source water uh, source water protection practices. We have some practices that would be available at a higher payment rate in these areas. Um, go ahead with the question, please. Thanks. This is from Pat Stabler. Will the high priority source water protection watershed be able to be revised annually as additional info is received from water utilities and others? Um, and, and then in parentheses, addition solutions to maintain 20%. Yes, so uh, we don't actually um, know how often they're going to want to uh, update this, and I did ask that question previously, but I would say we were gonna, we were going to continue to take um, suggestions, and then as we have opportunities to um, update our list and make changes, uh, we will. Yeah, and we'll we'll follow national direction based on that, Pat. So you right. um, well. may want to keep these. Uh, these uniform for next couple of years, but we may be moving forward um, in the future. So we'll we'll look forward to hearing from our national office about that. Any other questions, Tim? That concludes the questions so far. All right. Thank you. Thank. Uh, with that said, thanks, Ashley. Um, moving on to Peter Poglin or State Forester. Peter, uh, would you like to talk about the Joint Chiefs Initiative? Yes. Uh, Thank you, Denise. Can you hear me? I can hear you yes. just fine and can see your presentation. Thanks. Okay, great. Thanks. I'm going to briefly cover our uh, Joint Chiefs uh, Landscape Restoration Partnership application for uh, fiscal year 2021. Uh, a little background on uh, the Joint Chiefs Landscape Restoration Partnership initiative. Um, this is a partnership uh, that is used as a tool for achieving the developmental uh, 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 vision, the departmental vision, excuse me, uh, for increased collaboration amongst federal agencies, states, and private partners uh, to target investments for addressing landscape scale priorities. So through this program, the U.S. Forest Service and the NRCS are working together to improve the health of forests where public forests connect uh, to privately owned forest lands. And the initiative funding is available by application only, and funding is not guaranteed. The initiative focuses on forest health, water quality, and wildlife habitat for at-risk species, as well as reducing wildfire threats. You may recall in um, Pennsylvania, we had a funded Joint Chiefs Landscape Restoration Partnership project from 2017 to 27, or 2019 uh, in partnership with the Allegheny National Forest with support from PGC and DCNR. This is the map from uh, last year's NRCS annual report for Pennsylvania, which shows in green dots the general locations of projects that were funded over the last three years uh, from uh, over the three years of the project. Uh, so the project area was a 15-county area in north central Pennsylvania and included deliverables for funding requests for projects on uh, U.S. Forest Service, Allegheny National Forest lands, as well as private lands through NRCS. Uh, so over the three-year period that we had the Joint Chiefs Project in Pennsylvania, uh, we were able to obligate about $1.2 million in financial assistance on 93 contracts, which covered about 31,000 acres in conservation practice acres. Uh, and about 41 of those 93 total contracts were for the development of new forest management plans. So uh, the Pennsylvania project that was funded in 2017 was one of 85 projects that have been funded nationwide in this initiative so far. Uh, this initiative began in 2014 out of a collaborative partnership agreement between the U.S. Forest Service and NRCS. So our new application uh, includes a lot of partner contributions such as uh, collaboration with the Pennsylvania Prescribed Fire Council and the Pennsylvania Game Commission to conduct private lands prescribed burning workshops. It also includes funding requests that would go uh, to the DCNR Bureau of Forestry and the Center for Private Forests at Penn State for the adoption of two unique programs that would benefit private forest landowners. Uh, these programs were originally developed by Cornell uh, for New York landowners, uh, and they are the Assessing Vegetative Impacts of Deer Program and the Tools to Assess Risk in a Changing Climate Program. 
Uh, the project also includes partner collaboration on the Allegheny National Forest for projects such as aquatic habitat projects uh, that would be done in coordination with the Western Pennsylvania Conservancy. Uh, the total project request is for about uh, $6.4 million over a three-year period. Uh, and just as a point of reference, our uh, previous proposal from 2017 to 2019 uh, totaled about $5.2 million, but uh, several hundred thousand uh, dollars uh, was never received by state agencies, uh, which was included in the previous proposal uh, through uh, U.S. Forest Service state and private forestry accounts, uh, which would have gone to implementation of projects on PGC or DCNR lands. The actual only funding that state agencies got from the previous proposal was about $30,000 through state and private forestry forest stewardship fund. Uh, which was able to be obligated to a project recommended through the um, Pennsylvania Woodland Stewardship Innovation Team for a communications uh, development project, uh, what we're calling a Welcome to Your Woods project for private landowners, uh, and that project is uh, currently under development. Uh, so for the NRCS side of the proposal, uh, the new proposal uh, will be requesting about $1.6 million over a three-year period, which would be managed through the Environmental Quality Incentives Program, uh, and that's uh, financial assistance that would help with commonly utilized forestry practices like forest stand improvement, brush management, herbaceous weed treatment, uh, tree and shrub establishment, and we've also included some modest acreage objectives for planning and implementation of prescribed burning. Uh, we do currently have just over uh, over 100 forest management plans in the project area that were written uh, with financial assistance from NRCS, but have not yet received financial assistance for practice implementation. Uh, so this project will help us to address those projects that already have plans, um, which make them eligible for EQIP uh, conservation practice implementation. Uh, so this project would cover the same footprint as the uh, fiscal year 17 through 19 project, uh, which includes uh, that 15 county uh, area in north central Pennsylvania. So here is what our uh, application timeline is looking like. Uh, so over the past couple months, uh, we've worked with the Allegheny National Forest, the Game Commission, and DCNR Bureau of Forestry to develop our proposal. It was signed off by the DCNR State Forester, uh, Denise, the NRCS State Conservationist, and the Allegheny National Forest Supervisor, and was submitted to the U.S. Forest Service Regional Office in early October. Uh, it was evaluated by the Regional Office, uh, along with other projects from the 20-state region, and our project was selected by the U.S. Forest Service Regional Office, along with only two other projects um, to be submitted by the National Headquarters for funding consideration from our region. Uh, so we expect that uh, funding selections will be announced in early, uh, early to mid-December. Uh, and if we don't receive funding for this year, then there will be another proposal solicitation in January that we can reapply for uh, in the next uh, fiscal year. And, uh, and we're keeping our fingers crossed. So uh, if you have any specific questions about the current application or the past project, uh, please feel free to reach out to me and here's my contact information. Great, thank you. Do we have any questions for Peter? There was one question for uh, Ashley's presentation. Do the Pittsburgh, Harrisburg, and Philly designations include suburbs of those cities? Um, they are the city line would be the determining factor. So um, we can answer that. Um, Amanda, do you have anything else you'd like to add? Okay. Um, Hi, sorry. Um, Sorry about that. Yeah, no, the the, um, the urban fund pool, as uh, Denise said, it's just to, it is going to be within the city lines for this year. Um, moving on. Okay. Um, next, we'll have um, our CREP update, and we have uh, three individuals that want to give a, a CREP report. Uh, Jim Gillis, our state biologist. Um, Audrey May, our U.S. Uh, Armed Service Agency uh, Prep Manager, and Kent Adams, our Presence Forever Coordinator. So uh, for the for the East Coast. So I'll turn it over to Audrey, and then um, Jim, you don't have anything you want to. So, um, 
turn it over to Audrey and then um, go to, to Kent next. So, Audrey? Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Audrey. Thank you, Denise, for the introduction. So, just a quick summary of the crop acreage in PA. So, in Ohio, we had over 6,000 acres for the season grass, over 4,000 acres in the native grasses, and over 1,500 acres in the repair, repair and information cover, correction, the repair and forest cover. So, that's a little over 14,000 acres they're mold this year. Um, so that's for the depth peak. We had over 50,000 acres in the cool season grasses, over almost 15,000 acres in the native grasses, and over 14,000 for the recurrent forest buffer again. So that totals over 85,000 acres of mold for this year. And Delaware follows the same suit, basically. Uh, the roll is um, higher in the cool season grasses or the native grasses. So, for this year, we had over 14,000 acres enrolled in Ohio, over and about 845 contracts enrolled. We had 5,591 contracts enrolled for a total of 85,490 acres in Chesapeake. In Delaware, we had five contracts enrolled and 75.8 acres. Um, so, in total, we had over 100,000 and 65 nine tenths of acres enrolled and 6,441 contracts. So that's basically it. And then any questions or anything that anyone wants to add? Thank you, Audrey. And so uh, Ken Adams, who, um, for any of you that aren't familiar, NRCF uh, is the technical arm to the Conservation Reserve Program and the Conservation Reserve Enhancement Program that FSA administers. But we also uh, not only do our field people help on that, but we rely very heavily on our partners um, through uh, Pheasants Forever. And for just a little bit of uh, an idea of what happens, um, as you can imagine, this is a partner, joint partnership with Pennsylvania Game Commission and NRCS, and um, we share uh, funds. Uh, to, to work through Pheasants Forever, which also takes money from private donations to um, help employ several biologists uh, on the ground to um, work, install plans, and install uh, prep practices. So with that said, um, Kent Adams um, has been a longtime partner with NRCS, and I'm pleased to introduce him to give a, give a report. Okay. Thank you, Denise. Uh, I heard my line was unmuted, so I'm assuming everyone can hear me. I uh, appreciate the the background introduction there. I was going to try and do something like that as well, so now I don't have to. Um, yeah, this uh, I, I found out I was going to do this, I think, a day or two ago, so I don't have a presentation prepared. I do have a couple visual aids uh, if I share my screen here, uh, just kind of showing where our biologist team work. And uh, let me make sure I do this correctly. And we can hear you, but we're we're still seeing okay. Audrey's uh, table, so uh, we'll let you know when it pops up. Okay, thank you. There, there yeah, should I just... be a. Did you get it? There should be a series yep. of buttons and a box. Okay, you got the box. We're still okay. I think it's just turning. Yep. Do you have our, my map up now? Yep, we got it. Okay, good deal. Yeah, so um, I don't have any uh, any earth-shattering information for you here, but I was sharing our uh, quarterly report that we send in uh, with Denise earlier this week, uh, talking about our accomplishments. And, and we generally, our folks mostly work on CREP. Uh, they do work on the other conservation programs uh, <laughs> under the Farm Bill uh, that are wildlife habitat related. We're, we're, uh, we've got seven biologists on the ground out there. You can see the colored portions of that map there, mostly where they're working, um, you know, primarily overlapping the, the Chesapeake Bay watershed uh, where, as you saw from Audrey's presentation, the, uh, the most of the crep acres occur in the state. So. Um, I just was uh, particularly pleased with the effort this year, and it wasn't just Pheasants Forever effort, but um, combined efforts from uh, the folks at FSA who were also dealing with 
an incredibly large uh, workload um, due to the COVID-19 relief that they were not expecting. Uh, and then, of course, NRCS folks as well, uh, working on some tough deadlines uh, and working remotely and having challenges connecting with producers and things like that. So I thought it was just uh, an extraordinary effort by everyone this year to pull together and, and meet the, the CREP and CRP deadlines that, that just passed a, about a month ago. So um, we, uh, I, I thought I would use this opportunity to, to share a few numbers. Um, and keep in mind, this is just one quarter uh, that I'm reporting on here. Hopefully that changed over when I clicked in the other file. Um, but our folks uh, processed about 45 brand new CREP plans this year, which is an encouraging trend from a CREP standpoint. We've been declining for some time uh, from the peak in the early 2000s um, and uh, various reasons that we won't go into today. But um, we are seeing some new interest out there. Uh, and, you know, I would uh, ask all the partners and, and all the folks uh, listening in today, you know, if you uh, have the ability to, or, and the interest to get involved in getting the word out there, um, and working with our staff on the ground out there to do education and outreach and help landowners understand how to use this program. Um, please reach out to us. We'd be more than happy to collaborate with you and, and work on that. As we go into the winter months, uh, that's usually a great time for that kind of work. Obviously, uh, when, uh, when it's after harvest and we can get the attention of, of farmers and producers and um, you know, one thing we're really focusing on, I think in the past, you know, CREP was viewed as, um, you know, kind of all or nothing, either I'm farming or I'm not. Um, and I, I, we're really trying to focus on those unproductive acres out there that every farm has, that uh, every field has in most cases, um, that basically make a better financial situation for the producer or for the farmer. Um, by, by uh, removing those unproductive acres from their overall production. So uh, we've looked at a lot of subfield practices, including HEL. I know a lot of folks um, associate up with riparian forest buffers, which obviously that's a big part of it. We do a huge amount of them ourselves. Um, you can see down the, the line there how that we kind of uh, separated the, the upland HEL acres from the riparian acres to kind of give you an idea of how that broke down in terms of uh, practices that were installed uh, during this, this past quarter. But, um, you know, the, the upland buffers uh, along field edges where there's shading and root competition and wildlife crop damage and things like that also uh, come into play and are great places to put these kinds of practices in. So. Um, if anybody uh, uh, has any questions about, you know, how to get in touch with these folks or how to uh, set up a workshop in, in conjunction with one of our biologists, please let me know. I want to get the word out and, and help people find their way to uh, practices that will help them on their operations. Um, some real quick just general trends were, excuse me, that we're seeing out there uh, with CREP. We are, you know, continuing to see um, – a, a net loss on CREP acres. Um, and, and I want to speak, I, I should have said this at the beginning, I'm speaking for about the 20 to 25 counties that my staff work in. Um, this is not a statewide snapshot, but I do believe it, it reflects a lot of what's going on out there on the statewide picture. Um, so, you know, folks are uh, not re-enrolling at 100%. So, um, you know, we're seeing some you know, varying re-enrollment rates, everything from, you know, 80% uh, in, in the good counties where, where we've maintained good rental rates, uh, all the way down to, you know, 15 or 20% where rental rates are less than half of what they were when they signed up 10 years ago, uh, which you can understand that, make, that makes sense. Um, there's only so much we can do uh, working with those rates. Um, uh, we are, like I said, seeing a little bit of a, an, I think, an uptick in new interest, uh, new enrollment. Um, you know, 
we're having some challenging years. Uh, farmers are having some challenging years, and so that bottom line is getting thinner. And, you know, it's starting to sometimes make sense to look at those unproductive acres and, and uh, pay closer attention to that. Um, the other thing uh, I would mention is, you know, we're, we're still using pretty dated cost share rates at this point with CREP, and I think that's one of the hindrances that we're seeing right now is um, it's getting a little harder to um, get folks interested if they're going to have to pay a lot out of the, out of their own pocket to establish practices, even though there is a an annual rental rate coming on the back end. So um, that's all I had. I like I said, this kind of was on a whim a, a little bit, but uh, did want to did appreciate the chance to say a few words and uh, and acknowledge the effort of all the the people that worked on this program this year because. Um, I, I can I cover more than Pennsylvania. I live in Dauphin County here, but I cover uh, a big part of the the East and Midwest for Pheasants Forever, and we saw this pressure on CRP across the board. It was probably the toughest year I've ever seen in terms of the amount of work that had to be done and the amount of time we had to do it on top of the additional uh, challenges that 2020 brought us this year. So I uh, just wanted to say thanks to everybody who helped us get through it. Thanks, Ken, and thanks, Audrey, for your report. Um, certainly appreciate that. We're going to have a little change up in the agenda. Uh, Susan Marquardt is going to speak um, now. Uh, she's, got, she's being called to be on another meeting, so um, I'm going to turn it over to Susan, um, who's going to give us a little bit of an RCPP overview. Susan? Okay, thank you, Denise. Um, just want to let you have some information about what's going on in RCPT right now. We have uh, received one of the Alternative Funding Arrangement Awards. There were 10 projects in the United States that were funded for $50 million. And we ended up with one here in Pennsylvania. We had five applications in Pennsylvania um, that were submitted for an AFA and we were awarded one of those projects. And it's, the name of it is Improving Forest Health Through Aggregation. This project was submitted by the Nature Conservancy, the Pennsylvania Delaware chapter. Um, the lead partner contract contact is Ellen Lott. We are the lead state in Pennsylvania, and we're also working with New York State. Uh, the NRCS funding amount awarded was $2 million. The partner contributions are going to be $3.8 million, and this was funded through the state and multi-state funding pool. This project, just to give you a little bit of an idea of what they intend to do, the Nature Conservancy is going to implement and test a new forest carbon and easement aggregation model. They want to enable the protection of significantly more forested headwater properties than has been possible to date. They want to increase the amount of forest land under certified forest management and ensure continued protection of high-quality drinking water resources throughout the Upper Delaware River watershed. So the objectives of this project are to develop legal agreements for aggregating individual landowners into unified carbon projects to utilize new tools to prioritize resilient properties with high carbon potential, to enlist two to three forest landowners in Pennsylvania and New York into a pilot project that combines permanent working forest conservation easements and improved forest management through tree farm or forest tuber chip council certification mm -hmm. and enroll these forest landowners into voluntary carbon markets. 
So that's what's happening with the AFA, the Alternative Funding Arrangements. Also going on right at this time, um, we are working with our lead partners for the 2019 RCPP Classic Projects that were awarded. And I think I told you about those at the last meeting. And we will be starting to develop the agreements with the lead partners for the AFA project that I just told you about. And I'm gonna be in training here. It's already started, so it started five minutes ago. So we'll be working on that very soon. The um, FY 2020 and 21 RCPP Classic Round is, is open right now, and they have combined the funds for 2020 and 2021 into one application period, and it is currently open. So the total funding available in those two years have been combined and it will be 30 $360 million. The application deadline was extended. Originally it was November 3rd, but now it has been extended to November 30th. So if you were thinking about applying, you still have plenty of time to put an application together. The maximum project can, can be $10 million and the minimum project um, can be no smaller than $250,000. And I am the Pennsylvania NRCS RCPP coordinator, and I'd be happy to work with anyone that has any questions and would like to put in an application, my contact information, and uh, send me an email or give me a call, and I'd be glad to talk to you. There was a question from John Bell. Is there any more detailed information available for the AFA project that was awarded for PA? Um, just the information that I provided um, in the PowerPoint, that's pretty much all we have at this point. Um, and that was what they put in their proposal. So as I mentioned, we're gonna be start getting started on that today. So. I'll be getting more information. That's it. That's it. Great. Thank you, Susan. Appreciate it. Okay. Moving on uh, to Hathaway. Hathaway, you want to give an overview of conservation easement? Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me all right? We can hear you just fine, and we can see your slides. Nice. Thanks. Um, so next slide, please, uh, Tim. So the first thing I'd like to discuss is uh, the wrap up of our fiscal year 20 easement accomplishment. Um, it was kind of a crazy year with all of our new technology, but we, um, it was a good year. And um, we have some great accomplishments to share with you guys. Uh, we enrolled one WRE project totaling 18 acres and $127,394. It was not a bog turtle easement, but it's a nice project um, on floodplain, and I think we'll have a, a nice restoration to go with eventually. Uh, we also enrolled three ALE projects this year, totaling 183 acres, $209,000. And those projects, um, we, we originally had six applications, but not everyone made it through our eligibility screening process for ALE this year. Uh, closing. We did close on one WRE, and this was our WRE funded through RCPP, and that was about 45 acres and $255,000. And we are currently, we've currently contracted the restoration for that, and we'll be working on that in the coming months. We also closed on four ALE parcels this year, totaling 580 acres and $755,000. Uh, as you know, uh, Pennsylvania has been working really hard to restore our wetland project after the easements have been acquired, and we've had a lot of success and um, made it through the backlog of our wetlands needing restored. This year, we restored one WRP, totaling 43 acres and $293,000, and we also restored 10 WREs 
totaling 195 acres and $430,000. And I'd like to note here that since 2018, with our, our efforts to catch up to the backlog of restoration needs, Pennsylvania has restored 60 WRP and WRE easements, totaling over 758 acres and $2.9 million. So that's a great accomplishment, and I think the whole uh, team of people that have helped get those projects through the pipeline uh, need a, a big thank you. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, we uh, have announced our funding for ALE and WRE, that's ASIP, and um, we haven't received our funding yet, of course, we're still waiting for that, but um, we are encouraging people to apply for both programs at this time, and um, applications can be provided and accepted at any time for these programs. And we're also encouraging partners and landowners to work on basic eligibility at this time, especially filing their adjusted gross income or AGI compliance paperwork and making sure their, their AD 1026 or AGL wetland compliance paperwork is up to date. And that documentation can be filed with their local county FSA office. Um, and we recommend that they visit the office in person. I know it's kind of a challenging time for that, but it's very helpful in making sure the forms are completed correctly, especially for landowners who aren't familiar with those forms and haven't been um, involved in USDA programs in the past. Um, next slide, please. Uh, just a note here, this wasn't really on my agenda, but we are hoping to uh, extend our the GARC values, that's geographic area rate cap that we use for the wetland easement per acre uh, in regions and counties across Pennsylvania. And we're hoping to extend the values that we established last year in 2020 for 2021. We are in the process of developing that and we'll share those with you once we get them finalized and approved. Next slide, please. Um, another note, um, the wetland restoration criteria and guidelines document that we shared at our last state technical committee meeting has been finalized and um, the final version of that was provided to you with the documents for this meeting. So hopefully everyone's got a copy of this and um, we will be updating this, you know, throughout the fiscal year as things change and updates are required. And um, we'll provide you with updates as, as those come down the pipeline. Uh, next slide, please. And a brief note on Healthy Forest Reserve Program. We're in the process of setting up the subcommittee with partners um, to discuss rolling out this program and, and the species we'd like to target and the changes in the program that we'd like to see in Pennsylvania. But we have not received that guidance from our national office yet on how the program will work under the new farm bill. So we're still waiting for that. And again, if anyone's interested in um, in participating in the subcommittee meetings, uh, we did set a deadline um, for people to uh, ask to be part of that. But if you're still interested, the, the deadline's passed, you know, just send Susan or me an email and we can add you to the list since we have not received that final guidance yet from our national office and we are still setting up that meeting. So it's not too late. Email Susan or I um, and we'll include you on the subcommittee for HFRP. And I believe that's all I have. Does anyone have questions? Does anyone have questions for halfway? There, there was a question. Are you anticipating higher WRE enrollment once the restoration backlog is caught up from 10th Avenue? Yes. Yes, we are. We're hoping to, um, we're going to do another training this year for, uh, we had a big training in 2019, largely for in-house NRCS, and we're, Susan and I are going to work on an online training for 2021 that will include more partners and, and people who are out there in the field talking to landowners, and we're going to work with field offices to try to ramp up outreach to potential applicants for the wetland program. I feel, yeah, and, and I'm pretty sure that um, now that our restoration backlog is more under control, we'll be ready to um, 
be more aggressive in obtaining new applications for that program. Any other questions? Uh, there was just one other question, which was a follow-up from John Bell for Susan Morfolk's presentation. Yes. And he, he, uh, so I know she's gone now, but can additional information be provided in the future when it becomes available for the AFA project that was awarded? I uh, was looking for more detail on specific activities that would be performed uh, as part of that award. Yeah, my understanding, John, is they're going to be easements. So it's going to be forest management and then easements um, will be put onto ground for carbon storage. So um, we're happy to provide information when we get more information on that. That's it. All right. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Hathaway. Appreciate it. Um, Thank you. Want to just give an overview. Um, we are taking names um, for people who are interested in working with us on urban issues, and that would be an urban subcommittee. So if you are interested, uh, please contact. Um, you can go through Ted Evans and, um, and Susan and myself. And we will put you on a list. And the purpose of this uh, subcommittee is to, again, look at our practice standards as well as our job sheets for laser practices that we put in urban areas. Um, we're also looking to see uh, how we can better outreach to urban uh, producers. So uh, welcome anybody who is interested in being on that subcommittee. Uh, we need advice and uh, extremely interested in getting that advice. So um, the, generally speaking, for those who aren't familiar, these urban committees, these sub committees, uh, many of them are ad hoc committees. They come up uh, when we have different issues. We call people together. And um, after a period of time, they kind of, the issues are resolved and they, they kind of uh, die on the vine or uh, they're, they, but they occasionally flare up again, and we have different people. So we have a forestry committee, a wildlife committee, um, and if you're interested in serving on those, we're more than happy to um, certainly get your input. Um, with that said, I'm uh, going to open it up for comments or questions. Do we have any more, Tim? Nothing else here. Okay. Our next state technical committee meeting is January 21st. I anticipate, uh, like this one, it will be virtual again. Uh, so, And it's actually nice to have this one be virtual because uh, the weather usually doesn't cooperate in January. So uh, thank you, everyone, for your participation today and look forward to um, working with you the next few months and to see, hear you again in January. And uh, one last question. Uh, Rick Phil asked who to contact about the Urban Ed Committee. And I he can contact me at denise.coleman, C-O-L-E-M-A-N. Maybe Tim can type that up while we're talking, at usca.gov. Denise.coleman, C-O-L-E-M-A-N, at USDA, as in U.S. Department of Agriculture, .gov. And it's in the chat. Okay. Thanks. Looking forward to it. Take care, everyone.